and uh, good morning, everyone. And I have to uh, join Aaron in his comments that when I was asked to do an inspirational TED Talk on anabolic stewardship, I got a little bit of a knot in my stomach because it's not really the sexiest topic that you're going to hear about at APSA, nor the most exciting. But what I do hope to persuade you today is that it is among the most important. And this is not only because of the obvious relationship between stewardship and the public health crisis that we know as antimicrobial resistance, but also our role as pediatric surgeons in the problem as well as the potential solution. And it's really going to require that we work together. Now, why now should we care about this as pediatric surgeons? You know, this is something that's not new. We've all seen these news reports of the superbugs, right? That these are bugs that are resistant to just about every single antibiotic that we throw at them. But this is not new, and we can even say that some of these, you know, reports are a bit stale and they really don't raise eyebrows anymore. But what you may not know or really appreciate is the scope and the magnitude and the trajectory of this problem, much of which has not been well characterized or even appreciated until just the past couple of months. Now, how bad is it, and does it impact the patients, the pediatric patients that we care about? Well, there was a recent CDC study that just came out last month, and they estimate that over 2 million patients a year suffer from infections with resistant organisms in the hospital. And this comes at an annual cost of roughly $20 billion per year. And this is largely due to the prolonged hospitalization that's required to treat these infections. Now, that's staggering when you think about the fiscal imperative of this, but think about 23 million, I'm sorry, 23,000 Americans die every year from these infections. No, that's staggering. And then when you back up and think, well, who are the segments of society that are impacted most by these trends? It's the elderly and it's the extremely young with the largest impact seen in children under one year of age, right? So this is a very real problem, and it definitely impacts the patient populations that we care about. So what about us as pediatric surgeons? You know, what is our role in this? Well, part of it is awareness, it's knowledge, and understanding what we do in terms of our practice with antibiotic utilization, and what should we do? Well, there's pretty good data emerging as well that we have a lot to work to do, and there's plenty of opportunity. There was a recent study of freestanding children's hospitals, and it showed that over 40% of all patients undergoing clean surgical procedures without foreign body implantation receive unindicated antibiotic prophylaxis. Right, that's fairly alarming. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we look at patients who get antibiotics appropriately in terms of indication, over 50% of those patients will get their antibiotic prophylaxis extended well past the incision closure. For cases such as colorectal procedures, the average duration is two and a half days of prophylaxis. And remember that these are elective procedures, right? These are not emergent procedures. When we think about antibiotic spectrum, almost 30% of patients will receive an agent which is well broader than the recommended guidelines. Double coverage is common, right? Flagyl and Zosin, anyone heard of those two? Right, that's only quite frequently. Antibiotic utilization, right? So anaerobic coverage for proximal GI cases, the stomach, the small bowel, that's very common as well. So it appears to be a lot of opportunity that we can focus on and improve upon as us as pediatric surgeons. Now, part of the learning objective today is not only to educate and make people aware of what we do and what we should be doing in terms of current consensus guidelines, but also coming up with a prioritization framework. What should we be doing as pediatric surgeons that we can make the biggest impact in improving stewardship within our field? So, and back to Dr. Powell's um, comment about the top 10 list, well, these are the top three situations, topics, events in pediatric surgery, which is responsible for about 85% of the inappropriate use of what we do in this room. The runaway winner, is giving prophylaxis for clean cases without foreign body implantation, about 50%. Prophylaxis after incision closure is number two. And then finally, giving, again, anaerobic coverage for proximal stomach and small bowel procedures. These are the top three, again, 80 to 85% of all the inappropriate utilization. So what I challenge everyone today to do is pick one of these, 
go back to your department in a faculty meeting, begin the discussions, dialogue, right? What do we do? How do we practice within our department? How does it align with these guidelines? And can we begin to think about perhaps becoming a little bit more compliant with these guidelines? What do we need to do to accomplish that? Now, for everyone who's equal opportunity in this room, I'd strongly suggest number one, right? So not only because that is the most important thing we can do collectively to improve stewardship, but also it's probably the lowest hanging fruit, right? It's a lot easier to not give antibiotics for clean cases than to persuade people to choose a different agent or maybe even shorten their duration. Now, there's another important reason to tackle number one, and that is between APSA and the ACS and ESQUIP are starting to develop resources of other institutions who have successfully addressed number one that can be shared so you can be more successful with this as well. Okay? And so that's a nice segue into another critical message of the talk, and that is collaboration, right? Working together and sharing resources to combat the problem. Right? And so this is really taking a page from the bacteria playbook in terms of what we can share to address the bigger picture. Now there's an important reality check here as well. Right? So I can tell you what the three priorities are. I can challenge you to go back to your departments and make a difference. But that's pretty, it's tough, right? It's tough to make change. You have to go back and deal with a lot of personalities. You have to project manage. You have to change culture. And that's typically something that us surgeons, we didn't train to do, right? And there's also cost, there's resources, there's a lot of potential barriers. And so the opportunity to leverage the successes of other people in this room who have successfully carried out these stewardship projects, that can be really invaluable, particularly if we want to move the needle across the entire field, right? Very important in terms of collaboration. So what I wanted to do is spend a few minutes to talk about two potential resources that might be particularly valuable for those of you who want to go back and change the culture of stewardship within your organizations. The first is our own pediatric surgery library. You saw a slide about this at the very beginning of the session. And for those of you who haven't checked out the new website, it is awesome. Lots of great resources, educational resources, and it also has a section at the lower left corner, quality improvement toolkits. So what are those? So the toolkits are descriptions of successful quality and process improvement projects that you've all done at your institutions. Okay? In addition to those descriptions, there's also practical resources about how to emulate and carry those out at your own institutions. Right? Things about rollout plan, how to change the culture, pitfalls, barriers, and a mentorship structure. So every one of these toolkits also has a sponsor from you in the audience who is available to mentor institutions about how to take that back to your institution and successfully carry it out. Now, there also happens to be a new section dedicated to antibiotic stewardship. And later on this afternoon, you're going to hear a few more details about one such project, which has to do with a little bit of our own dirty laundry down the street at Boston Children's. So there was a point where we overused antibiotics for clean surgical occasions. Again, that's not in compliance with the guidelines. And I can't tell you too much more because one of our fellows is going to give you a little bit more about the punchline and the details this afternoon in the toolkit session. But what I can tell you is we made a huge impact and significantly decreased this utilization. But it was hard. When I took this to my boss, Bob Schamberger, I told him we have to do this. This is really important. And like always, he was very supportive, but he kind of chuckled, laughed too. And he says, you know, if you can change this group, good luck. Because you know we have a lot of knuckleheads, and we also have Craig Lillehei, old dogs, and it's hard to teach them new tricks, right? He didn't really say that, but... And I know, wherever, wherever Dr. Schamager is sitting, he's telling the person next to him, I did not say that, I swear, right? But the fact was, it was very difficult. It was challenging, right? I have like 24, 25, 26 partners. It's really hard to keep track. I don't know most of them, actually, right? <laughs> But there are a lot of issues, right? A lot of personalities, a lot of people to align. And we took a faculty meeting, the entire faculty meeting, to hash this out, to address misconceptions, and get people on the same page, and we did it. So if we can do that at my institution, you guys can definitely do it at your institutions as well. 
And again, please don't miss the afternoon session because you'll hear more about how we did that and how we can help you accomplish the same thing. The second resource is Pediatric Nesquip, and this is familiar to most everyone in the room, I would imagine. But what you may not know is in the last three to five years, we've really changed the type of data that we collect and compare among institutions. And there's ever more of an emphasis on collaboration and knowledge sharing. And last year, we launched the first collaborative among 84 hospitals, I believe the largest collaborative of children's hospitals ever, which was dedicated to antibiotic stewardship. And this is formally supported by the college as well. So a large part of this collaborative is webinars and a set of breakout sessions which are dedicated to stewardship, best practices, ideas, projects, and it's really meant to be complementary to what we're trying to develop within the APSA toolkits. Right? So a lot of the same folks are working on both to try to keep them complementary. Right? The other very unique aspect about the collaborative is that all 84 hospitals are collecting an extended set of prophylaxis utilization data. So we're gonna be generating report cards based on current consensus guidelines for hospitals to use. So not only will they have that collaborative framework of knowledge sharing, but they'll have data to know where they should focus their quality improvement efforts where they're needed most within their own institution. And so for those of you who are part of Pediatric Nesquip, right, as part of the hospitals, and this is a complete, you know, this is absolutely news to you, reach out to your surgeon champion and ask them about it. Or you can even reach out to me and I can give you more background information and how to get engaged and let you know what we're gonna be doing in the future, okay? So in concluding, I did wanna leave you with a, another sobering statistic or more accurately, probably a projection. So the data I showed you before from the CBC, 23,000 deaths per year, that's quite alarming because that's happening now. But that pales in comparison to what will happen in the future if the continuing trends or if the trends continue. So there was a study that came out last month from the UK, and this was commissioned by their CDC equivalent, and they projected that in 2050, 10 million patients will die from resistant infections. Again, if the current trends are not averted. That is staggering. Now, will Big Pharma come to rescue us? Well, the trends would also suggest that that's not gonna be the case. Over the past two decades, the relative proportion of budgets dedicated to the development of new antimicrobials has decreased substantially and is now less than 5% at most of the big pharmacy companies. And with that, we've also seen a parallel decrease in the number of new antimicrobials. And this is not gonna change anytime soon. So this is up to us. We have to own this. And we have to be more responsible, and we have to be more thoughtful with our antibiotic utilization but we can make a difference and we can move the needle with awareness and knowledge and working together. And collaboratively, I think we can make it better for our patients. And this is gonna be very important for the well-being of our future surgical patients as well. So again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, 